Live, ready to go. Hi, it's Leslie with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center, and I am here with Eddie Midland. And uh, boy, I tell you, he has such great information for everyone. So uh, sit back and relax and enjoy this webinar. We're going to be talking about uh, how to attract and retain customers. So it's basically three sales essentials everyone should know. Throughout the entire webinar, just go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A because we're going to be picking them up through the entire thing. Uh, Eddie is a SCORE certified mentor, so we're glad to have him here with us for a little bit longer um, presenting this topic to everyone. I want to remind you to set your Zoom ratio to fit windows. Again, like I said, we'll be using the Q&A function to take any questions, so please feel free to type in anything that you like. Um, <laughs> to the topic. We will also be sending you a copy of the slideshow afterwards. So you're going to get this in a follow-up email. It's going to have the New Mexico COVID-19 business resource page on it. So don't worry about getting a screenshot or frantically writing everything down because we're going to be sending it over to you. Also, we're going to be sending you a list of our upcoming workshops. We have so many for your small businesses in marketing, cash management, uh, accessing financial resources. So there's something I think that would help you in any stage of your business. We also have the no cost confidential counseling. It's available on our website at nmsbdc.org. I go over everything, Eddie. I think you did great, Leslie, as always. Awesome. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hello everybody out there. I hope everybody can hear me and see me. And so I'm gonna to talk to you guys about sales for the most part. And the main thing that I always like my audiences to do is when I finish after this roughly 40 minute talk, and then we'll have time for Q and A, is for you guys to leave this webinar and say, you know what, I learned one or two or several things that I'm actually gonna try in my business or work on with myself or work on with my team. So, so that's really my whole goal. We all go to a lot of webinars and things and I really do my best to make it fun and, and entertaining. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so these two people, uh, most of you probably know the gentleman on the left, Peyton Manning, who was one of the best quarterbacks ever. And the lady on the right was a fantastic athlete in her own right. Her name was Pat Summit. <clears throat> she was a great basketball player. And then she coached at the University of Tennessee for, I think, 20 or 25 years. And she was holds many, many records. And what I want to read to you is a quote from each of them, because you may, a lot of people think, why do, you, why do I start this presentation with these famous sports people? It's because sports people prepare and practice just like salespeople should. And most salespeople don't. Most people that run businesses don't practice and prepare for every phone call, every email, every person to person meeting, but we should. So Peyton Manning has a quote, and I am also an author. And so I have this in my book and Peyton says, I never left the field feeling I could have done more to prepare, and that gives me peace of mind. So obviously Peyton Manning won you know, more games than he lost, but even when he lost, he knew that he had done his best to prepare for you know, the defense that he was facing, know his offense so well, and he had done all of his homework. Now, Pat Summit, the lady on the right, her quote is, most people get excited about the games. I've got to get excited about practice because that's my classroom. So she talks a lot about practice. Now, obviously, they both these people did practice and preparation. But I, and I love sports, so I equate a lot of sales things, and you'll see as I go along here, to sports. Because the best athletes practice and prepare like crazy and they know exactly what they're gonna do. And so we as salespeople, I'm retired now, but for my career in sales, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit, what I did, but 
you've got to be prepared and know exactly what you're doing so you don't waste time, you don't waste your client's time or your prospect's time. I'm going to talk about the art of selling. Now, these famous athletes all know there's an art to throwing a football, there's an art to dancing, you know, actors, they know there's an art to that. And so there is actually an art to selling. And I'm going to do my best to teach you what I feel is the art of selling. And a big part of that has to do with the importance of a coach. One of the reasons I was successful in my business, which I'll tell you about now, I, I had my own business since 1988 until about four years ago when I retired, representing companies that make floor covering products like carpet, tile, wood, all kinds of flooring. And I always had people that I relied on. And I, I, see, I, I looked for them. I was going to say I seek them out, but that's not a good word. I looked for people to help me to get where I could bounce ideas off of. And that is what's so critical in every aspect of sales. And it's important to have an ongoing relationship with this person or people. In fact, the people that I mentor on a regular basis, I always suggest to them that they do not rely just on me because I sure don't know everything. And I, I can help most people a lot, but I want them to have two or three or four other people that they confide in and ask for help and share information about their business. Now, the other thing is that we can't see ourselves what we're doing wrong. And every pro athlete knows this. So here's the thing that I want you all to remember is everybody that makes millions of dollars a year, and I mean everybody, they all have coaches. So why is it that people that make 30,000 or 50,000 or 80,000 or whatever, why don't those people have coaches? Well, they should. And so I'm a big believer in, in having a coach and like I say, an ongoing relationship because it's tough out there. And so get people you know, that can be in your corner and help you. So the main goal here is to increase sales and we're gonna talk a fair amount about that. So we're gonna add new customers, but what a lot of people fail to realize is that retaining the clients you have right now is really more important because it takes so much time to get a new client. You've gotta meet them, you've gotta build a relationship with them, they have to trust you, it takes a lot of time. So you absolutely have got to baby or babysit your current clients and then as you can, you wanna add new clients. So taking action and invest in yourself. And when I say invest, I don't necessarily mean uh, monetarily or you know, with money. I mean, you can buy some books and take courses and things like that. You don't have to invest a lot of money. Uh, and so like Leslie said, SBDC has you know, free counseling. I do counseling through SCORE. It's all confidential and the people that succeed and have less headaches are the people that take action and, and actually do things to work on themselves. Now, we all know in life that most people uh, say they're going to do a lot of different things to improve their life or improve themselves. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't. So I hope you'll really give us some serious thought because why go at it alone or even if you're a partner in a business or, or whatever? We just all need people to talk to. So here's a kind of a cute little picture where just a bunch of salespeople are thinking about what do I do next? So I'm gonna give you three specific topics and then there's gonna be quite a few things in each topic that over many years I have realized, in my opinion, are the three most important topics to succeed in sales and to understand. The first is organization. So I'm gonna to explain to you how I organized myself and please let me be clear, I, am, I, I never tell anybody how to do anything. So I'm just giving you an example because all I want is the wheels in your brain to start thinking is how can I, you, the person watching this webinar, be more organized. So 
I don't care whether you do it the way I do it or not, but most people in life are not well organized. And I can tell you most salespeople that are full-time salespeople, they're, they're not well organized either. They don't know what they're doing tomorrow, which is pretty bad. So again, this is how I did it, not how you should do it. So I had, I worked by the project. So in the flooring business, I, I'm gonna give you an example. I've worked a lot with architects and building owners. And so let's just take an architect, they're designing a building or it's gonna be remodeled or a new building. Well, it takes a long time to design that building. So I used paper and pen. Most of you will do this on the computer and that's fine. So I had a piece of paper for every project and I would write down the name of the project, the architect, the building manager, anything I knew about that. And I would keep track of that basically forever. And so the two stacks of projects, the first stack was projects that I was gonna follow up on this month, August of 22, for example. The bottom stack of projects is projects I'm gonna follow up on starting uh, October. Did I say August? Anyway, so the first, I'm sorry, we're in September now. So the first stack is any project I'm gonna follow up on this month in September. The bottom stack is projects I'm gonna follow up starting October of 21 through the end of time, basically. So in the top right corner, I would always write follow up, a follow up date. Now, at the end of every week, I would take out the stack of projects. And of course, when you start, there's hardly any, but once you get this process going, and this is what sales is all about, is having a system that fits your brain. Um, so I would pull out all, pull out the stack and I would go through all the projects I'm gonna follow up on in September. And I would decide, okay, the week of September 6th, which is this week, which ones am I gonna follow up on and so forth. Now, the bottom stack, I would go through at the end of every month. So obviously right now they would all say 10 slash 22 or later. So at the end of September, I'd go through it and I'd say, okay, these 12 projects, or two projects, whatever, the person suggested that I get back with them in October. So then I move that to the top stack. So a lot of you may have heard about the funnel. Um, that's pretty easy to visualize. And that's basically what I was doing. I created this system that worked for me. So I hope that makes sense. You're always knowing when you're gonna follow up on the next projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Then I had a old fashioned calendar where I would write down people that I was gonna go see face to face. Then I had a weekly to-do folder, and this was just a manila folder that I'd open up, and on the right side, I'd literally have a piece of notebook paper, lined, you know, college ruled notebook paper, and that was all the phone calls that I was gonna make or things I was gonna do that relate to the project uh, that I'm following up on. So basically, um, if you have the manila folder on the left side, let's just say there's five projects, five pieces of paper. And then on the right side is the piece of paper. And it says, you know, project A, project B, project C. So that's what I needed to do. And then when I was going to make that phone call, I would look to my left in that folder and I would see all my notes of what I knew about that project and what my goal was what would I was trying to find out by making that phone call. And that's something I'm gonna talk about too, is every phone call that you make, every face-to-face, -face, every email, every text, basically every communication, there has to be a purpose. And what is that purpose? So you need to know what, what the things are you wanna accomplish and don't just call up somebody and say, hey, how you doing? I'd like you to buy more you know, product X from me. Um, you got to have a specific things you want to talk to them about. Then I had a database so I could quickly find everybody's name, phone number, the people that worked at the company, uh, all that kind of information. Planning at night or on the weekends is really critical. I learned this early on in my career. And that is so important because come Monday morning when work starts, you want to know exactly what you're going to do that week. So take time at night or on the weekends to plan for the next day or the next week. I had what I called the ABC 
list. And this was basically prioritizing my customers. And so the A clients were my most important. They were not necessarily my largest customers. And let me explain what an A client is to me, because I think that's very important. And that is where you have a mutually beneficial business relationship with that customer. In other words, you appreciate them buying from you, hopefully on a, whatever a regular basis is, and they appreciate you as a professional salesperson or owner of business or, or whatever your position is, because you help them get the information they need. You stay on top of the projects you're working on with them, and they value that. Now, we all know as salespeople, the reality is most people don't value salespeople. They think, well, they just don't value us. So if you can have some of those uh, A clients, that's wonderful. Now, the C, I'll go to the C clients next. Those are usually more like transactional clients where you only have do business with them maybe once or twice in your whole career. So they're not as important. Now, the B clients, obviously, are going to be the majority of your clients. And the thing I want to tell you about this ABC is I highly suggest you think about having honest discussions with your customers and let them know where they fall. And you have to be a little careful about this because you don't want to go to somebody and say, oh, you're, you know, you're one of my C clients. Is no, you just, just say, I categorize my clients and I want to do a better job with you so that we can be more important to each other. And that's the key thing. It's all about you don't ever want to say to a customer, hey, I want you to buy more so you'll be more important to me. No, it's the other way around. <clears throat> what you want to do to the client or say to the client is, what can I do <clears throat> Excuse me, to be a better salesperson to earn more of your business? And you're wanting all these customers to move up from C to B and from B to A. Now, all these things we've talked about so far are about being efficient with your time and everything that you do, because you want to spend a lot more time with your A clients than you do your C clients and the planning and the database and the weekly to do's and the keeping track of projects. If that's how you work, if you're in a retail store or you happen to work in any kind of retail environment is you want to keep track of your customers. Um, but being efficient is probably one of the most important things you can do. One of the best compliments I used to get is people would say to me, Eddie, you don't seem to work that much. And believe me, this was not at the beginning of my career, but after many years of hard work, it did. It was that way. And I would play golf in the afternoons or work out and people saw that, but it was because I, of all these things we've already discussed, I was highly efficient. The next topic is follow up and you know, follow up and organization, they go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. How can you follow up on something if you're not organized and you don't know what you're doing? The key thing I want to tell you about this is how do you find out when to follow up with somebody? And another thing is I've made many, many mistakes in my career. And my goal with you and everybody that I mentor is for you to make fewer mistakes. And so that's why I want to kind of tell you these things, hoping that you won't make as many mistakes as I did. And so I used to guess at when people wanted me to follow up with them. And that was a big mistake because everybody has what I call their line in the sand. And if you, if you follow up too soon or if you follow up too late, you, know, you probably miss the sale. They'll buy from somebody else. So you got to find out when to get back with them. And the best way to do that is simply ask them, when would you like me to follow up with you? And they will tell you. And regardless of whether you know, you're selling a car or you're selling computers, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, they will give you a date or you know, get back with me in a week or a month or next year. I'm thinking about buying this type of a product. And if you are the one that does this properly and follows up with them all the time when they've asked you to, they will most likely give you a good chance at getting the sale. And I can also tell you this, 90% of salespeople will never do this and they won't do most of the things I'm talking about. So if you do some of the things I'm talking about here, you're gonna be ahead. 
Stay in touch with everyone. A lot of people think, I'm just going to stay in touch with the people that buy a lot from me. Well, that's, in my opinion, not the best way to go about it. Uh, and you want to stay in touch with people that buy and also people that don't buy because people that don't buy from you can be good sources of leads. Again, it, there's so many variables. I don't obviously know what each of you sell and what your product or services are, but you all know that if you stay in touch with people, they can, and you're nice to them and treat them with respect and follow up with them, even if they never, you never make a dollar off of them, off of them personally, you may make thousands of dollars by staying in touch with them because they will give you leads. <clears throat> you wanna be one step ahead of the client and I'll give you an example on this. Is so, and we'll just talk about carpet. So, if a shipment of carpet is supposed to come into one of my clients and it's supposed to arrive next week, my job, not the client's job, is to find out if it's still on schedule. And and either way, my job is to communicate with the client when that that carpet's going to arrive. Now, obviously, most of the time it arrived on time or sometimes ahead of schedule, but always. There were always, uh, you know, every year there were problems and delays. You want to tell the client that. They're not going to like it, obviously, but it's better to tell them ahead of time than the day before or, you know, not tell them at all. I mean, they're going to be really mad then. So tell them the thing that salespeople that, that you don't want a customer to have to do is to call you, email you, find out, hey, what's going on? Where is this? Where's that? You said you're going to get me that. They got other things to do. So take good care of your client by being one step ahead. Being prepared. That's, you know, we talked about that a little bit. That's all these things. And as I mentioned earlier, it has a lot to do with every phone call, every email. Know exactly what the next step is in the sales process. Most people that are salespeople, you're not going to go in and see somebody and get a sale. It takes time for people to trust you. And, and it's been proven that you have to see somebody face to face five times before they'll ever begin to trust you. And trust is such a huge part of sales. Talk about the 2080 rule. And I'm also going to talk about the 80-20 rule, which is probably what a lot of you are aware of. The 80-20 rule being that 80% uh, of your business will come from 20% of your clients. And that's pretty true universally. Uh, but what I also want to talk to you about is the 2080. And that is that 20% of what you do on a daily basis will result in 80% of your income. So what does that mean? That means 80% of what we all do every day is not very effective. So analyze what you do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and decide, is this making sense or is this not making sense? Is this producing results or is it not producing results? I want to tell you about a big project I sold by staying in touch with one particular customer, this architect I had known for a long time, and he had a small firm. And over about a 10 year period, I had made you know, a small amount of money by working with him. And then one day out of the blue, he called me up and said, Eddie, I have this really big project, this building that this person that owns the building has hired me to remodel it. And I'm going to do the design work. And I'd like you to handle all the flooring. And that was like a gift from the sky. And so I ended up getting this project. I treated them very well. You know, I made good money. They were fine with everything. But the reason I got that project is because I stayed in touch. And that's why I tell you, stay in touch with everybody. The next topic is psychology of selling. And I've always been fascinated with psychology. And so let's get into it. Number one, work on yourself. And like I said, with taking action and a few slides back, most people will never do this. So if you can work on yourself and try to figure out what you do in your relationships with your clients on the phone, in person, when you email, all those things, if you can kind of get an idea of what you can do to improve, that's good. And I would ask friends, family, coworkers, just to be totally blunt with you and honest, 
is what do I do that's good? What do I do that's bad? You know, and you know, whether you talk too loud or you interrupt or there's all kinds of things. And so working on yourself is not an easy thing to do, but I promise you it'll pay dividends if you do it. Then of course, the next thing is you gotta try to figure out each client and every client, every prospect, they have their own brain and they're gonna be different. So one example on that is I worked with a lot of architects, as I said, Sometimes I would go see one specific architect and when she was busy, she would just take me into the conference room and wouldn't sit down. Well, I'm pretty perceptive. So that told me she's gonna give me some time, but get with the program, Eddie, don't waste this person's time. So I went through what I had to go over with her very quickly. Now, other times she would sit down with me or you know, other people would sit and chat about all kinds of things. So you've got to try to figure out each, each prospects and each client psychology. So these are just some things I've worked on. You know, how much do you talk in a meeting? You know, do you talk too loud? Do you interrupt? Are you smiling? Are you aware of your body movements? So I wanna talk about smiling for a minute because now we're on the phone probably more than we used to be because we with COVID, we can't go see people as much. People can tell whether you're smiling or not when you're on the phone. You might think, Eddie, that's crazy, but it's absolutely true. So think about things that you can work on. Eye contact is very important to look people in the eye. The difference between listening and hearing is we all hear sounds all the time, but, but we have to really focus on what our client is saying and listen very carefully what they're doing. And this, I love this quote, is the best listeners are the most well-liked. And that's a fascinating thing. And if you can just get people, the other person, and this is something salespeople have to do, is we don't want to talk as much. We want to ask open-ended questions as opposed to, do you like this or not? We want to say things like, And this has to do with family, with get togethers of any kind, is people will think you are a fascinating person and they will really like you if you are a good listener. And the one way to do this is listen without the intent to respond. Is most people in, you know, in our society, you know, they're always listening because they want to know what they're going to say next. And one of the things that's really helped me is taking notes, because when you're actually writing down notes about what people are saying, that does a couple of things. Number one, and I'll just use me as an example, it helps me keep my mouth shut, which is a good thing. And so I'm list, I become a better listener because I'm concentrating and I'm writing down what the other person is saying. It also helps so that you don't interrupt, which is a terrible thing to do. And, and then the other thing, you have your notes there. So when you talk to this person next, you know what they've said and you're keeping track. So really with sales, it's, it's a, I guess you could call it a grand you know, dialogue. You might have this customer for years and years and years, and you can look back on notes that you took three years ago or 10 years ago and, and know things about this person and their buying habits. Now, this is, this, when I say I need a helper, I do this in person, it's a lot easier, but I have someone come up to the front of the room and I, we stand about 10 feet apart from each other and we're facing each other. And I tell the other person, let's pretend we work at the same company and we're gonna walk towards each other like it's in the morning and we're just gonna say hi to each other. So the first time we walk towards each other and you know we wave or we say hi or something like that, and then I say, okay, let's do this again. And so we walk towards each other and I put my hand up like this and I say, hey, how are you? I know you weren't here last week. How are you feeling? Or I know you had a sick child or a sick family member. How's it going? And the point I wanna to make to you guys is in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we say, hi, how are you to many people? Do we really mean it? Well, I don't know, but, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, when you really get to know something about 
your customers, your prospects, you know, family members, friends. It makes that relationship so much better, which is all psychology. And that's what you're trying to do in sales is build a relationship. Okay, communication is part of psychology. And this is a wonderful thing that of what I'm telling you today and anytime you listen to somebody, 58% of what you hear is nonverbal. That means, you know, uh, body movements, all kinds of things. 38% is the tone of voice, which I sure can work on. And then only 7% is the actual words we say, which every time I say this, it's astounding to me. So think about your nonverbal things. You know, are you shuffling your feet? Are you tapping a pen? What are you doing? How's your tone of voice? Are you smiling? It's really fascinating. So yeah, I've learned to talk, talk softer, not click a pen, which I used to do because I was nervous sometimes in meetings and taking notes. As I said before, that helps you kind of keep calm. The words, please tell me are very powerful. And I use this all the time you know, with my family, with friends, uh, you know, when I was in business, I use it now with people that I mentor. Uh, and I've added the words before it is, will you please tell me? So if I were to meet any of you for the first time, I just said, will you please tell me about your business? Well, I don't think any of you are going to get upset with me, but because it's a nice way of saying it. That's the whole point. It's a nice way of saying it. And believe me, I've learned over many years, you know, I guess how to say things nicer, how to put things in emails that are, you know, um, with better wording so that it comes across as nicer and I'm not telling anybody what to do or anything. So again, will you please tell me, and then you could say anything. Will you please tell me about your family? Most people are not gonna get upset with that. It's nothing personal. And as salespeople, we have to be really careful with that. So I highly suggest you use those words. The word so that, or the word because in front of other words, helps you state the benefit. So let me give you a couple examples. I think you should buy this computer I'm selling so that you'll be so organized with your daily work and sales, it's gonna be so fun and you can take the computer with you and it's lightweight. I think you should buy this computer because it's a really good price and I know you're gonna enjoy using it. So try to think about using those words when you're summing up your sales, um, you know, your closing argument, whatever you wanna say, the close, and it helps you state the benefit. And when I say benefit, that's as opposed to the feature. So, you know, let's just talk about computers or cars. There's tons of features about it. I'm not a technical person, so I couldn't tell you hardly anything about what's, you know, in the computer. I don't know how they work. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's beyond me. I know we all use them, we all need them. So if somebody starts telling me all kinds of features, but doesn't state the benefit to me, who cares? So anytime you tell somebody about any feature of the product or the service you have, please be sure to tell them the benefit. Okay, I know how to juggle and that gives me confidence. And I do, I use juggling actually when I'm, you know, doing presentations, you know, face to face with people. And I talk about juggling because we're trying to keep track of all these clients. We have big clients, small clients, things we've got to do in five minutes, things we've got to do in five days. You know, in our personal life, we've got to go to the grocery store. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. How do we keep track of all of it? So, and I'm going to get back to this in a second, but Pat, and then I want to talk about the words passion, fun, and profit. So if each of you, and I, I hope you see the passion that I have with doing this for free because I love it. It's fun for me to help other people. So I have passion. And if each of you can have passion and get excited about the product or service you're selling and you have fun with it, that's going to lead to profit or commission or money or whatever word you want to say. So try not to think about, oh, I got to sell this today because I, you know, I mean, we all get in that, you know, predicament sometimes. But try to have passion and excitement because it's contagious and your clients and your prospects are going to see that you love selling this product or this service and you're going to have fun with it. And my gosh, we want to have fun 
with what we're doing every day, right? And so if you do these things, I promise you, it's gonna to lead to profit. Now, the juggling, well, let me get to the next point here. A presentation without a demonstration is just conversation. So if I were just to talk to you and I had no slides, I mean, I tried to make my slides kind of cute, kind of fun, um, but if you don't have any kind of presentation, or I'm sorry, a demonstration, then we're just talking and nobody's gonna remember it. So as an example, and I know I can't do this for you guys on a webinar, but if you were to see me juggling, you would always remember that, I promise you. Oh yeah, you know, I talked to you six months later or two years, oh yeah, you're that guy that came in and gave a presentation, you know, or I came to this luncheon and you were the speaker and you juggled. Now you may not only remember that, but you're gonna, you're definitely gonna remember the juggling. And it gives me confidence because I am able to juggle and most people can't. So what I'm suggesting you guys do is come up with some kind of a demonstration for your product or service. Now, some people say, Eddie, I don't know how to do that. And obviously, I, you know, they, they, they're selling whatever and they're like, well, how do I make a demonstration of that? Well, you know, get some drawings, get, um, you know, have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, have an object that you can bring in that people can see, touch, you know, look at, um, that they will remember you by that demonstration. That's really, really powerful. The last slide I want to talk about is me personally. And so I'm an Eagle Scout. I grew up in Kansas City. I came, I live in Albuquerque now and I have for a long time, but when I was 14 years old, I became an Eagle Scout and I went out to Philmont Scout Ranch, which is in the northern part of the state near Cimarron, if you're familiar with that, up, up, way up on 25. And so we hiked in the mountains for 10 days, and I could give you a lot of specifics, but the point is, which I have in parentheses, scrawny kid survives. So that was me. That, I was the scrawny kid. I was lighter weight than most people. I was skinny. And so hiking in the mountains for me for 10 days was harder than the average boy, you know, at that time. And so the reason I bring this up to you is I survived, okay? So now, and throughout my whole career, when I've faced scary things, whether it's personal or business, is I've thought back on things that I've done, you know, two days ago, 20 years ago, that I did it. And I guarantee you, every one of you have things that when you were a kid was scary, was a tragic, a tr you know, a, a, something scary, you know, maybe last year, and you worked hard to overcome it. We all overcome things. And people think, oh, Eddie, you couldn't have been scared to make sales calls. And, but I want to tell you, even though I'm very outgoing and sociable, there were times I didn't want to go see certain clients or I just didn't want to do it but I had to overcome those things. There were times in my career where I wasn't, I needed to really work very hard to make the money I needed to support my family. And I got after it. I mean, I absolutely figured out ways to do it. And so I just wanna close with this, that we all have things in our life that, have, that we've overcome and making sales calls is not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's not. So. I hope you'll think about that as you're going through you know, your sales career. So basically in summary, we've talked about three categories. The first is you've got to be organized. I don't know how anybody could be an efficient salesperson without being extremely well organized. The second is you've got to follow up and stay in touch with everybody and know when is the next time to see that person, talk to them, email them because there's always a follow-up date. I don't care if it's three years from now, you've just sold them something. You wanna stay in touch with everybody. And then finally, we talked about the psychology and the communication skills and working on yourself, which is very difficult. And then trying to figure out, you know, every prospect and every client. So those things we talked about, and now let's say I'm gonna turn it back to you, see if we have some questions that we can discuss. We don't have any questions coming in, and I do want to remind anyone, if you do have questions, type them into the Q&A. I also want to remind you, um, Eddie, about I sent over a link to pick up your cold call. 
handout. Okay. But if you could just talk about that for a minute, because <laughs> thank you so much. Um, they like you tonight. I, so that's great. But let's talk about just briefly that cold call handout that you're going to be sending that I'm going to be sending out to everyone. Because when you're talking about the story of what scares you as a kid, and sometimes sales calls can be very uh, easy and uh, profitable, but sometimes they, they can't. Sometimes they're a little scary. So tell us about that. Okay, so I wrote a white paper on cold calling several years ago, and you can get this from Leslie, and that's one of the scariest things that you know people bring up quite often to me is, you know, they're scared of, of making a cold call. So let me break it down, and I'm going to use one analogy for if you work in a retail store and one if you are calling on a business. So if you're calling on a business, which is primarily what I did, so let me give you that analogy. When you walk in to any business, I don't care if it's a dentist office, an insurance office, a bank, all your only goal is to talk to the person that greets you, whether that be the receptionist, a secretary, it doesn't matter. And you wanna introduce yourself to that person very briefly, let them know what you do and your name and get their name and their contact information and just say, this is the product or service that I have. Will you please, and here we go back to will you please, will you please tell me who the person is I should contact at your company to discuss my product or service? And literally that's your only goal. Now, you want to get that information and you want to write it down. So when you leave that building, you want to know the name of the person that you just met, you want their email, and you want the person to follow up that you're going to follow up with next. And that's it, period. That is all you want to do. You're not trying to sell anything. You're not taking any samples of anything in. You're not taking any brochures. And then when you get back to your home or your office, is you send that person that you met an email thanking them for their time with you and you really appreciate it and you really appreciate them telling you to talk to whomever that other person is and that you will be following up with that other person. Now, that does a couple of things. Who's ever going to send a note to a receptionist? Nobody. Okay, so if you do this, you are way ahead and you will be talking to this receptionist or this, you're gonna see this person again, I promise you, sometime in your career when you go back to see the buying, you know, the purchasing agent or, or whoever. So people think, oh, you know, he or she is just the receptionist, that they're not important. Well, <laughs> they are, they are absolutely critical. So now, then after you've done that email, then whether you phone call or, or, uh, or make a phone call or send an email to the next person, you reference the person's name that you saw when you were there. And you say, I spoke with Eddie when I was at your facility and he suggested that I contact you about X. Okay, that does a couple things too, is that is gonna tell the person that you're communicating with now, the purchasing agent or the owner of this business, whatever, that's going to tell them that you have talked to somebody in his or her building, and they are much more likely to take your email seriously. Um, and so that's really kind of what you want to do. So it's, it's a, you're, you're building a relationship with the person you meet, then you're trying to build a relationship with the next person. And that's really all you're trying to do. Now, there's a little more to it, but that's basically it. Now, if you're selling, working in a retail store, is, um, and, and, and I guess it's not a cold call, but somebody is walking into your store and you're selling clothes or furniture or whatever, is you want to walk up and act as though somebody has walked into your home. And I don't mean somebody that you don't know, but I mean a friend who's walked into your home. You know, welcome to our store. We're so happy you're here. You know, my name is Eddie, 
And, you know, I'm here to answer any questions and I just want you to have a good experience. And, uh, you know, please tell me, again, please tell me what type of furniture, what type of whatever, you know, you're looking for today. And you wanna engage them in something. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, I'm just gonna look around, that's fine. But you do your best to engage them and make them feel welcome. And I wanna mention one more thing that I didn't talk about with, with retail stores is working in a retail store, you can, uh, well, let's just put it this way. I know people that make a ton of money working in a retail store and because, and the reason they do it is they have a system similar to what I told you I have. That, and I'll just give you one specific example. I know a lady that makes well over $100,000 a year working at, I don't know, I'm not even sure what it's Dillard's or Nordstrom's or something, but she knows her customer. She has a database. She keeps track. She knows when to follow up. She understands the psychology of all of her clients. She knows some like to spend hours shopping, some hate shopping. She knows that some of the ladies that buy from her um, have daughters, some have granddaughters that they want to buy things for. She knows all all this stuff. I don't mean she memorizes it. She has a system for writing it down or putting it into her computer. And she is proactive, meaning she doesn't wait for that customer to walk in. She knows what sizes they wear, what colors they like, all kinds of things. And when those kinds of things are available or new shipments come in or getting ready to come in, she will email these people or call them and literally set up a time for that person to come in. Now, it might only be four times a year or six times a year, but she is making the purchasing process easy for each of her clients. And that is exactly what I'm suggesting you guys do too, is you make the purchasing process easy for your customers. So that's some information on, you know, cold calling and, you know, and, and I, I have, we are sending the handout out and I, if we have time at the end, I'll see if I can screen share because I do have it up, but we do have a question. Okay. So the first part is, it's what do you do to hustle money as a father, I guess, you know, with your doing sales and everything like that. So I base it in, he says, how do you balance work and home life? So so I think it's a it's a great question on how you get that work life balance and also how are you maximizing your sales to and your customers. Okay, so good question, and I'm going to go back to being highly efficient. And so I'll tell you what I exactly what I did on my calendar. So I because um, I needed to work out on a regular basis, because if you're a father, um, you know, or, or we're, you're taking care of someone else, the only way we anybody can be helpful to other people, whether you're a caregiver of a child or an elderly person or whatever, is we have, and this goes back to psychology, is we have to take care of ourselves mentally and physically. So I know that for me to be the best father, husband, you know, friend, golf buddy, whatever, is I've got to take care of myself. I got to go to the gym. So basically every other day I go to the gym and I write WO for workout on my calendar and I circle it. And it's on the calendar and I guarantee you 95% of the time I do that. So it is a priority and, and life is all priorities. You know, where do we spend our money? Where do we spend our time? Um, there's a there's an old thing I learned a long time ago that if you want to see what you're doing in your life is look at your calendar and look at your checkbook because if, when you look at your calendar you know over the past six months or six years whatever and see what you've been doing and you look at your checkbook or your you know your credit cards whatever your money where's my money going am I spending money on things that are you know, not the best for myself and my family, or am I spending money on my children? You know, so think about that is think about where you're, look and look at it. Study where you're spending money and where you're spending your time. Now, 
more specifically is, um, you know, I went to all, most of my kids' stuff. I mean, I did some traveling, so I missed some, but, you know, my kids and my wife are and were my priority. And so I put their sporting events and their, you know, scout meetings, our daughter was in Girl Scouts, our boy was a Boy Scout, um, basketball games, soccer games, I put it all in my calendar. So I knew, and my wife and I, we used to call it actually, my wife and I called it a, a calendar cross check, where like every week or two, we would get our calendars together and decide, you know, who's doing what, and who's taking what kid where, and that kind of thing. Um, but it was an absolute priority. So that's what I did. And I, you know, I am highly efficient and that's not bragging. That's just the truth. I could spend two days telling you all the hor things I'm horrible at, but I happen to be highly efficient. So I, I knew what to spend my time on. And like I told you in the talk is I spent time with other, with mentors finding out how to be more efficient, how to do a better job. What am I wasting my time on? People waste time on all kinds of things. People spend money on silly things. Um, and I could give you a whole talk on that, which I won't. People spend you know, money on going out to lunch. You know, Think how much time, and I know with COVID it's all different, but take a lunch. What's the big deal? If you're working in an office or wherever, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Eat a sandwich at home. If you spend time going to a restaurant, how long does that take and how much money are you spending? And how much, you know, so there's one thing right there that hopefully will help all of you is lunch, is going to get a cup of coffee. I don't drink coffee because I always thought it was, you know, people sit around the water cooler or the coffee machine drinking coffee. And to me, that was a waste of time. Now, I'm not saying don't drink coffee. I'm not saying don't eat lunch, but but don't take an hour and a half or even an hour to drive somewhere and eat lunch and come back and, and spend 10 or $15. I mean, if you can just sit at your desk or sit in your backyard, if you work at home and eat your lunch and get back to work and not spend that money. So I'm rambling a little bit, but I hope that helps a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to have some, we're going to have some slides up that'll have some resources for you, which is good. That way, if you're looking to get a mentor or some counseling and stuff, we're gonna have that. But we do have some questions. I'm gonna talk about this, but we do have another okay. question that's come in. Okay, this is interesting. And the reason why it's interesting because um, she talks about she teaches piano, but it could also be for any other kind of service industry or something like that. How and where do I cold call for new clients? Okay, that's a good question. And what I tell everybody when you're wanting to get new clients is start with your existing clients and start with friends and family. So I would make a list of everybody that you have ever taught piano to and are currently teaching piano to. And I would absolutely reach out to each one of those people and I would, and also friends and family. Doesn't matter how you know them, friends and family, and tell people, I am interested in growing my business and I would appreciate your support. And I would appreciate any ideas you have, people that you know that might that like music, that might be interested. Um, so start with the easy things. And that's why I say friends, family, and current clients, as opposed to cold calling, because that's, that is, it is hard. I mean, it, and so I think, and I don't know where you live. I have, I don't know anything about you, obviously, but I guarantee if you've been doing this even for a short period of time, most people don't ask their current clients for referrals. And I don't understand that, but I'm suggesting you absolutely do that. There's not, that's not being pushy. That's not being, you know, too forward, anything like that. It's just asking for that. You want to improve your business. You want to have more clients and, you know, you would, I love teaching you piano, you know, whatever their name is. And I would sure appreciate you thinking about people that, that you know, that might be interested in learning how to play piano. And one thing leads to a neck than the other. And sales, keeping track of all these people, it's kind of like the octopus with all these legs is, 
you've got to keep track that I have five people I teach piano to now, and three of them give me a name of somebody. I talk to those people. Those people give me two names. I mean, you never know where this is going to lead, but you've got to keep track of it. And then I can tell you that most, uh, now teaching piano, I guess, is a little, uh, um, it's pretty straightforward, although I don't know. Um, but a lot of people don't really understand what other people do, where they work. So if, I would tell your friends and family, this is how I work. This is how much I charge. This is when I'm available. I would write down the things about your piano uh, teaching business and tell everybody that. So I hope that helps a little bit. We also, I did chat over a link to our YouTube channel and I'm going to be sending out um there's going to be a link in your follow-up email, but there's also some um, complimentary webinars that are on YouTube that we that are pre-recorded that kind of goes along with your question what Eddie's been talking about tonight. It is um, different ways of uh, uh, reaching customers, and so I want you to check that out, and I think that would also help. Um, we did have a couple, we had a chat come in, we had a question come in. Um, excellent webinar, Eddie, of course. Good balance of content, thank you. And also, uh, we have a question that come in. Are these programs free? I wanna tell you that SBDC, the no cost, it's no cost confidential counseling, which is great. We also have put in these slides that we have um, uh, different programs available. These are these are to help you with any kind of trademarks, intellectual properties, and patents. If you'll go to the next slide, I'll tell them about our resource partners. Um, I need Eddie to change. Oh, sorry. To the, that's okay. Can you I'm switch following. to the next slide? I want to tell. Them. It's okay. These are our resource partners. So we have SCORE, and that's where we've got Eddie tonight giving us the webinar and the information. Uh, you're going to get this information to you. We also have West. It's a women's business center program. They've expanded so anyone can use uh, their services and their consulting. And then we have VBOC. So any veterans that are interested in um, uh, business services, we have that also available. So all those are good webinars for you. And um, let me see. Oh, we're just about out of time. We're out of time. Um, but I will send you uh, SBA, the Economic Development Department, and you're going to get that cold call handout. I want to remind everyone to look through that. That's going to be available. And Eddie, everyone says thank you. And Leslie, I didn't do anything. So uh, the webinar was very informative. We appreciate it. Um, you will sign up for the counseling. It's at nmsvdc.org, and we are lucky enough to have you. Thank you again, Eddie. Boy, you're on a roll tonight. I want to <laughs> remind everyone that we will have Eddie for the uh, next couple of weeks. So if you have questions, please visit another one of his webinars, and he'll answer them at any time. Thank you, Eddie. Gosh, they keep coming. I can't keep up with them. So thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you all. Bye.